Valeria Jensen. I'm the Deputy of our Protective Resources Division for the Alaska region. And I'll let my two colleagues introduce themselves as well. I'm Susie Tierker Lilly. And um, I work on list of fisheries type work for the Green Isle Protection Act, which we'll talk more about. And I'm Kim Ramsarian, and I work primarily with pinnipeds, uh, entanglement, and deterrent issues. Yeah, oh, like the the I'm in the uh, 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 so uh, uh, there in a matter of about a week. I uh, work with the work with NOAA at the Sanctuary Program and um, with the large rail and response efforts and everything. Onward. Uh, so some of you may have a chance to work with him again and see him. Uh, I think there will be an upcoming workshop in your neighborhood. Um, and Susie and Cam here both have contact whale expertise and sea lion expertise. different 
uh, definition of harassment under the act. And so you have the injurious type, that level play, potential to injure or, or kill. And then the level B is the disturbance or harassment level. Um, so that, that just becomes important when, for instance, you have an exemption under the MMPA for level B harassment uh, to protect, hear, and catch. One of the questions I know has been on people's minds is this pretty monumental change that happened last year for humpback whale. Um, and there was quite a lot leading up to it. Um, some years of review of uh, status of the species worldwide. Um, so of course, you know, digging back into the history of the humpback originally being listed under the Endangered Species Act, 1973, of course, that was largely precipitated by the um, commercial whaling um, and destruction of many, many large whale populations around the, around the planet. So with that threat removed, there's been very strong recovery. Um, by the time 2009 rolled around, we realized it was time for a status review. In fact, it was long overdue for a global status review. And so the agency undertook that and out of that certainly came the recognition that there was strong recovery in certain populations and certain threats were controlled in certain parts of the world more than others. Um, so we weren't really looking at just a standard status any longer worldwide. And on top of that, science is now, we, we have enough science in our pocket, enough research to show that there's just a high degree of genetic variability among many, many different populations. So out of that came um, these changes that you saw last fall to the Act. And that was coupled with two other external actions that you may be aware of. So the petition from the Hawaii Fishermen's Alliance in 2013 to delist North Pacific humpbacks, and then in 2014, the petition from the state of Alaska to delist the Central North Pacific population, and that's actually a stock term under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, but essentially, it's the same group of animals. Um, so an interview both of those petitions found that warranted, and so those two actions externally in combination with that status review internally led to this status revision. And essentially what that did um, last September was to change the single species um, into a, a new uh, designation of 14 distinct population segments. And that's a term, that's a, a specific kind of technical term under the Endangered Species Act. So those are genetically distinct populations worldwide with varying levels of, of, um, of population growth and threat. And so some remain endangered, some were li listed as threatened, and then some were taken off the act and removed from the act. And so we have three populations occurring in Alaska now. And that's, that's a global map, but for our purposes, I really want to focus on Alaska. And so what we have here are the Western North Pacific population endangered, the Hawaii population was removed from the Endangered Species Act, and the Mexico population is, continues to be listed as threatened. And when you look at this, you can see, wow, there's an awful lot of mixing going on. That's really one of the take home. And that's certainly a head scratcher for her managers. Um, and so in a case like this, we look at Southeast Alaska, given that we have individuals from the listed population, from the, from the ESA protected population in Southeast Alaska, we need to afford them the protection that comes with the act. And given that we can't visually distinguish between individuals from Hawaii or Mexico, we have to default to considering um, bags as endangered under the ESA, or excuse me, as listed under the ESA. So essentially, we consider we continue to afford them the, the ESA protections. And the same goes for um, stellar sea lions in certain parts of their range as well, where because we can't visually distinguish, um, we have to default to those protections. So for you, essentially, that means business as usual. Um, that's really the status quo of how we've been operating. Nothing is changing um, in terms of you know, a vessel's behavior around a whale. So we can talk more about that, certainly, in the next hour. 
Um, one of the things that is in the chain is just our Alaska specific comeback approach, right? So we, we did reissue them, but all of the uh, components of that have stayed the same. So, you know, spread that message in the community. If you hear questions about that, oh, they're delisted, so, oh, you know, now we can have close approach, or, you know, people may may uh, think that some of the, the operator behavior can change, but that's all remained um, just as it was before. And there's some questions about population levels. So I just really quickly wanted to give you the most updated information we have for humpbacks in the southeast um, from a paper by Paul Wade, who's down at our um, NIMS Alaska Fisheries Science Center and other authors last year. Um, the current estimate is about 6,000 animals that you can see for southeast Alaska. Um, if they continue to strong population growth of 5% is, is still that current estimate. That's the best information we have to date. Um, and again, that's including that mix of animals from the Hawaii and the Mexico population. And it looks like there was a, some questions about sperm whale. Um, certainly a, a concern for fishers. Long-standing depredation issues were all very aware of, um, we don't have any reliable population estimate. Um, there just hasn't been the work done. Um, we don't have, have unfortunately, the, re the resources to be able to monitor them as closely as we would like. So we don't have any kind of overall statewide estimate for, for the species, or for North Pacific for that matter. Um, you know, as I said, you know, depredation, of course, has been an issue since the 90s. Um, I'm actually curious if you all have had any sightings in, in Fredericksound or more in the inside waters. You can see that image from the FeeSwap website you may be familiar with. Jan Fraley and other researchers, you know, tagging sperm whales, getting some really interesting new information about range expansion into Chatham. Um, last year we even had a couple reports outside of Off Bay. So kind of remains to be seen what, what exactly is going on with these critters. Um, but a lot of uh, a lot of attention there with the fisheries and collaborations trying to mitigate that depredation issue. And on the million dollar questions here, we'll have plenty of time to um, you know delve further into this, and, and Kim's going to talk a little more about this. But of course, the question: Can I use deterrent to protect my gear, and what can I use? And I know this question comes up again and again, and you may feel like this when you talk to NIMS about this issue. Um, and suffice it to say, we feel like this as well. Um, we want to be able to give you clear messaging on this. Um, we want to be able to help you avoid violations. We want to win-win. Nobody wants whales and gear in the same place. Um, and we, we have really looked to our national program to provide that guidance, and it certainly has been long in coming. Um, so we thank you for your patience. Um, process now that's underway, and Kim will talk about that more, a national process to actually give more definitive guidance about exactly that. You know, method by method, what can I and can't I do? Um, but just to talk about the legality for a minute, um, under the Marine Animal Protection Act, that level B harassment is allowable, that is allowed, there's an exemption for that, and, and the part of the MMPA that very explicitly speaks to that, so fishermen are allowed to deter marine mammals in a non-injurious way to protect property and catch. Um, that said, there's no list that goes along with that, and I know that's where a lot of the frustration comes in, in terms of actual methods. As I said, that is to come. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, Kim can talk to the timeline on that. Um, of course, we, can't, we cannot allow any level A harassment with that or any intent to injure. That that would actually be, of course, a yeah, no lawful harassment situation. There's not an analogous exemption under the ESA. So here we're talking about the MMPA, we're talking about deterring porpoises, we're talking about deterring harbor seals. But when it comes to humpbacks, um, most other large whales, these are 
continue to be treated as ESA protected, so you don't have the same just explicit exemption given. And last thing I wanted to say here, um, beyond just you know the the sort of mechanical deterrence methods that might be sought, that might be used, um, that we might be looking to in the future, we also have just avoidance behavior and for prevention behavior. And this slide I just I really wanted to put in as a as a pat on the back to Petersburg as a kudos to you because. Your community was very proactive about engaging in these conversations with him. Um, you know, we think back, it was 2006 when Ed first came down and did uh, a Fisher workshop and started having those discussions about, you know, what's working, what's not working, trying to get those, um, trying to get that information circulated, get that wheelhouse, wheelhouse card produced, that sea grant and the Mammal Center, that was a great collaborative effort, and that actually inspired that same um, uh, scenario to occur, inspired us to continue those kind of fisherman conversations and workshops around Alaska, and then um, California also jumped on the band bandwagon, and it's had um, similar types of, of workshops, just brainstorming and problem solving um, with various fishing communities in California. So. Thank you for that. Thank you for your engagement on that and being willing to work with us on that. And I think at this point, I'll just turn it over to Susie to talk a little bit about the list of fisheries and the other kid. Great. Thanks so much, Illyria. Uh, that's a great setup for some of the um, Room Mammal Protection Act and list of fisheries questions that um, I was going to address today. So, MPA, uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, Section 118 is specific to incidental take of marine mammals um, over the course of fishing. And uh, this is um, actually a pretty unique element to this statute. And there is not another counterpart for, say, oil and gas exploration or other types of uh, uh, sectors of commerce, it, it really is specific to, to fishermen and it allows um, for this for incidental take to be exempt from the take prohibition. So um, I, I like to just you know remind just remind us that it is um, kind of a unique situation and it helps fishermen you know, be able to do their job and we know that fishermen don't want to take marine mammals and that is, is the provision, or that is the exemption. But there is a catch here that, that all of these takes, in order to be covered under Section 118, they need to be reported. Uh, so this is um, easily done online or through um, a, a reporting form that we have. The program is called the Marine Mammal Authorization Program. And most of the outreach through this is um, specific to fisheries that are part of that are category two on the list of fisheries. We'll talk about what that means. So uh, within this framework, the list of fisheries, uh, which I abbreviate is LOF, it's the accounting system so that um, we can watch for issues that are emerging, look for patterns, and um, just keep track of, of what types of takes are happening with what gear types and where. We manage the list of fisheries for the Alaska region, and, and this is something that's super interesting to me. I um, am part of a fishing family um, here in Juneau, near uh, the Long Island to Halibut, and I'm generally quite interested in, in fisheries, and um, I'm learning more all the time, but I'm really I'm excited to have the opportunity to work with fishermen. And the, the way that list of fisheries works is that um, dependent upon the history of interactions with marine mammals, there's three categories. And category one is reserved for fisheries that have frequent incidental mortality or serious injury of marine mammals. And we don't have any of these in Alaska. Category two is a category that 
and has occasional incidental mortality. We have several uh, that are currently listed as category two. Um, I hope you guys can see this, but I, I put them up there. And uh, there are many um, different regions of salmon drift and, and set net that um, are category two. There's also several trawl fisheries in the Bering Sea, the Asian Islands, and uh, the, the peacock fishery, uh, longline fishery in the Bering Sea, the Asian Islands. So it's my guess that, um, th that there aren't um, many fishermen in Petersburg who participated in any of the other category two fisheries aside from the Southeast Alaska salmon drift gilma. Um, so this is, these are the category twos, and the category three is for um, fisheries that have a remote likelihood or, or, no, um, or no known incidental mortality. This is all of the rest of them that aren't listed here. So in order to determine which fisheries fall into which category, we do an annual analysis and it is based off of data from the stock assessment reports for each species that is um, involved. Um, each species is um, given a what's called a PBR which is, stands for potential biological removal. This gives us an idea of the number of individuals that can be removed from a population before there's population level effects. And so we do, um, I, we actually have a, an equation that we use for this. It's pretty um, clearly written out formula for determining which category a fishery will fall into. Um, data doesn't continue to accumulate over time. We actually just look at a five year rolling window of fisheries interactions. And, and this makes sense if a fishery, um, you know, has uh, improved um, gear modifications that can help to reduce marine mammal interactions. We want to make sure that we don't, and that we are only looking at this uh, relatively recent five-year window. So, to give you an example, the 2017 list of fisheries um, is, for the most part, based off of data collected um, from 2010 to 2014. Um, in Changes to the category of the of fisheries can happen in a couple of different ways. One is if we get more information about um, increased interactions or just more data to show interactions, meaning there's some mammals in fishing gear. Um, but it can also change when we understand more about the, the species um, stock structure or abundance. And we have a question specifically about the um, Alaska Marine Mammal Observer Program and the data that was collected from that. So I pulled um, some just some stats from the, the portion of that program, which occurred in your neck of the woods. Uh, this was in 2012 and 2013 in districts six, seven, and eight. There were um, observers on board, as many of you may recall. And that was a, about a 7.5% coverage. And the, the thought is that you observe a portion of the fleet, and then you can extrapolate the, the data to the portion that is unobserved. So <clears throat> there were four different species of marine mammals observed interacting um, during this portion of the AMOP server program, and um, I provided the numbers here of, of the one, the numbers of individuals that were um, that were observed and interacting with the fishing gear, and then what that extrapolated into when it was applied to the fleet. So, if you're interested in the data from this specifically, there's a report um, about it that I, I have a link here and I'm happy to email it to anybody. And that it really gives 
the details on this. Um, so because of that, that data um, window that I described, 2010 to 2015, for the list of fisheries, this is currently part of uh, management for um, determining category list of fisheries. So that is, um, that's all I have for you guys right now on the fisheries. We're going to switch to a pen and and Kim will take over and we'll um, get back to questions at the end. Okay, this is Kim and I'm going to talk a little bit about stellar sea lines now. Um, just one quick slide on uh, regulations and Basically, um, as everybody probably knows, that the, there's the eastern distinct population segment of Southern Sea Lions and then the western distinct population segment. And um, we have um, Southern Sea Lions that are both endangered and also those that have been delisted. Uh, they, they are currently covered under both the Marine Mammal Protection Act as well as the Endangered Species Act. And there was a question about the current uh, population in the southeast. So the last range survey was done in 2014, and the total um, population estimate for southeast is about just under 26,000. So there's, there are a few different questions. Um, is our endangered stellar sea lions found in the Petersburg area? And the answer to that is, is yes. Um, they are the Western population. This is based on brand recite data. Um, Western population solar sea lions are actually regularly seen north of Sumner Strait and sometimes seen uh, south as well. So we can basically assume uh, that a solar sea lion in the Petersburg area could be from the Western distinct population segment, so it could be part of the endangered population. Um, and then I'm going to go on with what local officials and private individuals can currently do to deter stellar sea lions. So there's, right now, I'm sure everybody knows, there's no single non-lethal deterrence method uh, universally effective for sea lions. And very frustrating, <laughs> there's currently no NIMS list of specifically approved or prohibited marine mammal deterrence measures for use by fishermen and Deliria mentioned earlier. You know, this is very frustrating and, um, and we very much thank you for your enduring patience on this and it's hard for us to not give you answers and we're impatiently waiting as well. So for the, in the meantime, we need to take a common sense approach. <laughs> so on the bright side, um, in December of 2014, NIMS requested public input on which deterrence to consider for approval and um, some of you were involved in this process, you, you submitted comments. Uh, in February 2015, uh, there was a national technical workshop and since then there is a draft environmental assessment that's been completed and um, the hope is that there will be a draft um, proposed rule uh, that will come out maybe in the next six to nine months. So that's really good news. And then uh, that will have to, uh, that will go out for public comment probably for about 60 days. Then it needs to go through clearance. So we're hoping by 2019 that we'll actually have a list. And this is just an example of um, look like, so for example, there was a, there was a certain deterrent type here in, in uh, this first box of the table, and if it was prohibited, it would be in red. If it was approved, it would be in green. And if it was neither approved nor prohibited, kind of like what we have at the moment, it would be in gray. So what can we do right now until we actually have this list? Um, probably as everybody's already doing, uh, doing our best to practice avoidance techniques. So avoiding interactions to minimize risk to human safety as well as to prevent serious injury or, or mortal, mortality to marine mammals. And trying to avoid areas that are known to be occupied by marine mammals 
avoiding setting or placing gear in areas where marine mammals are sighted, and very importantly, not to discard fish over the side or in the vicinity of marine mammals. A lot of different kind of passive uh, deterrent devices used, and Petersburg has been on the forefront of a lot of this um, after their your issues there with the uh, aggressive sea lion a few years ago. And um, yeah, you guys are definitely uh, a community that we point to as, as doing a great job. So we really appreciate all those efforts. Um, another thing, a lot of, of different harbors throughout up and down the West Coast use these visual repellents. So um, flags, pinwheels, scarecrows, inflatable air dancers, um, ball, beach balls. But unfortunately, sea lions are very intelligent and usually they come out pretty quickly. And so it doesn't usually last for a very long. So kind of the golden rule, really the best way to reduce these issues is to ensure that there are no fish discards anywhere around the area so that it doesn't actually, it's like any other wildlife um, where there's a problem with wildlife becoming habituated. And I also just wanted to just to throw this out there, um, if anybody's interested in looking up um, this company online, smithroot.com, they actually make a pinniped deterrent system and it's been very effectively used down south. These pictures, before and after pictures, are um, down in Astoria. And it has a low voltage current that runs through it, just enough to kind of bother the animals, but not uh, injure them in any way. Um, so how are we helping communities with aggressive sea lion issues? So our most recent problems have been in Sitka and Gustavus. So, one thing we do know is that people are feeding sea lions. They're deliberately feeding sea lions. They're also leaving fish pieces or carcasses where sea lions can easily reach them. Only a, a huge problem. Um, and also, sea lions may be having a harder time finding natural prey, and then they end up venturing into the harbor, um, so they're looking for food. Add this in here that. Um, So just under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, feeding, attempting to feed, and harassment, and also leaving, deliberately leaving um, fish pieces where sea lions can get them is prohibited um, under the MMPA. So that's important to know. So um, feeding sea lions causes problems for all of us, no matter who you, who you are. Um, it causes habituation, so they lose their natural awareness of humans, and they start associating us with food, as you know, um, they can become aggressive, they can become unpredictable, and um, that's been a problem in a lot of different harbors. And as, I, as you all know, there uh, have ma major negative impacts to fisheries, feeding changes their natural behavior, it decreases their willingness to find their own food, it also increases the chance they're going to steal food and also interact with your gear, and fishermen and others have been injured from sea lions. It also is a problem for the animals themselves. They end up getting entangled. Um, they can uh, pass these behaviors to other animals. They can be injured from boats and also intentionally harmed or shot because um, they're, you know, people are super frustrated with their behavior. So one thing we've done recently, uh, we came out with this, these kiosk wrap cards. Um, we just came out with these just a couple months ago. Uh, and if anybody's interested we can send some down to you but basically kind of goes through what I just what I just said just kind of the problems of feeding sea lions and um, you know just to kind of give them um, a little bit of an idea of, of how this affects everybody as well as um, the animals themselves so basically it comes down to our own responsible human behavior in these cases if we have better and more, more responsible behavior, then uh, we'll have fewer problems with these animals. And then hopefully you all have heard um, the public service announcements on the radio recently. Um, these are running in May and June, just talking about not feeding sea lions. And I also wanted to mention that I'll be down at the Harbor Master Convention in October, so I'm looking forward to meeting um, some of you down there. And something that we hear Susie and Larry and I and others are very interested in is, is just we'd like to have more 
listening sessions um, with fishermen to hear your feedback, your ideas, your suggestions, any ideas for gear modifications, just and, and just what we can do to help with them able to do. So um, we just like to have more face-to-face -face time and more communication so that we can do whatever we can. And that's it. So if you have questions. Yeah, let's switch back to the camera. I just was wondering, you're talking. You're going to mention a uh, timeline for coming out with a list of acceptable or deterrence uh, for sea lines. Yes. Um, wondering. So, so the time. Yeah, yeah the timeline is. Repeat that again. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, if you could just repeat that again. I was wondering if that's being held up in terms of the regulatory hold up right now. Is that do you think that's really going to come out by 2018 or? So the. So luckily, it's not a, uh, what's the right term, it's not a, I can't remember the technical Anyway, it's not the two for one. We don't, you don't have to remove two to have this one regulation put in place because it's a statutory regulation. It's under the MMPA. It's actually in the language. So, yeah, the hope is that this draft proposed rule will be out in six to nine months. Then it will go out for public comment for 60 days. That's at least 60 days. And then it's, it has to go through whatever whatever steps it goes through until it's actually final and comes out. And that hopefully will be out in 2019. So they're working hard on it right now. And we, that's, we just, that's the latest we got when we um, talked to, that, to headquarters and got that information. Yeah, generally the standard, you know, the federal standard is a year between a proposed rule being published and the final rule. Um, actually on the street. So we're just, we're, pa we're probably padding it, we're trying to be realistic. Um, but the, when you're actually holding that list in your hand, probably early 2019. Um, that's our best guess right now. And as Kim said, it, the process, it so far has been independent of administration change. It just, um, it just has been the, uh, the process of having the initial workshops and really working through each type of methodology and potential impacts to marine mammals. That's really, that, that was at least the impetus for um, how it started and yeah, the time that's gone in so far. In addition, there's been some additional research, as I understand, on some methodologies, some mm -hmm. new, yeah, some new work that's come out that they're trying to incorporate as well. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're, I think what they're really trying to do is make this really solid now so that it doesn't have to be revised anytime soon. I mean, it can be revised in the future, but they're trying to do their homework and do um, as much research as possible on a lot of different acoustics and um, things like that so that hopefully we have a good list that we can work off of. Is the draft EIS, I know, the draft for this available on your site, on the mid-site? The draft will not be out for six, that one will not be out for six to nine, right? Sorry, did you say the draft EA? Yeah, yeah, or, the draft EA, that, that would maybe talk about what? Yeah, that's not, um, yeah, that's not, that's not on our website yet. That's not it's complete yet, yeah. yeah. But I assume it would be published with the final rule, so. Yeah. I have a quick question. Uh, I, I'm here for the um, sperm whale depredation. And I was just kind of, um, I've been on the uh, ocean for the last two months, actually in the Gulf all around. And uh, I've been watching sperm whales and fin whales kind of interact. And I was just kind of wondering, well, first of all, the reason that I think you can't get a deterrent list is because there isn't any. And uh, I mean, you know, we, we're sitting here in Petersburg and we put up a, a we we put up a survival suit and we're being praised for it, and uh, you know that's great to keep them off the dock. But we got guys going in the water, you know. Also, so it, anyways. But uh, more to the point is, I'm worried about the um, sperm whales and uh, how I'm interacting with them. So. Uh, I was hoping to hear some more about deterrence, and I've heard a lot of words about it, but you know, I haven't really seen any. 
and I and I and I see how you know the satyrs and you know I've been in Bristol Bay and I've had a pod of um, beluga whales come by the net, and I you know I was like oh my gosh this is crazy, but they, they saw the net and they just swam right around like it wasn't even I mean I couldn't believe it it was you know murky water and they saw it so anyway but the <clears throat> I guess I I'll get kind of get off point but. I've been out there watching these things, and I, and and us longliners are going to need some help, like from you or from somebody in, in this deterrent area. And uh, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm just praying that you guys can figure something out, or somebody can, but it's not happening that I've seen. Yeah, so are we. <laughs> we are, and I, I just want to say that there are a couple of, um, you know, a couple things. First, the Sea Swap Program, um, out of Sitka, which is an acronym that stands for Southeast Alaska Sperm Whale Avoidance Program. And they've, um, they've really you know, put a lot of uh, energy, and I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, the them or the fishermen who are, are working with that group, and um, it is such a difficult. Problem. Uh, the sperm whales are so smart. They are, it is really challenging to, to work around. And as you probably know, there's uh, been several fishermen are switching over to pot here, and NIMS authorized the, the pot fishery this year um, as one way to avoid that kind of interaction. Um, but, you know, that is a super tricky. Issue and such a smart species to be trying to work with. Yeah, and one further point on that with these, these lists that we keep referring to coming out, um, it would be great if they were just, you know, the cat meow and the catch all for everything and the solution we've all been waiting for. But we should we should caveat that uh, these are these are lists that are specific to impacts to marine mammals in terms of you know, potential negative impacts, you know, acoustic output, um, you know, are we, are rubber bullets a problem, are steel bombs a problem, not, they will not address effectiveness. Um, so that's, that's going to be a, a different, a different issue. Yeah. yeah, so as I understand it, they don't address, they don't address effectiveness at all. Okay. No. Yeah. I, but yeah, that, yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, I kind of, yeah, yeah, thank you. Because this, in his region as well as, or coming from the East Coast originally, you know, there's certainly been some creative methods used to try to get it, it you know, new gear modifications, new deterrents, you know, getting, uh, having those gear competitions, um, getting youth involved, you know, a lot of the nonprofit organizations have had gear competitions, WWF, and some of the other marine conservation NGOs. Um, Ed, do you have, do you have any, anything to add on that just from your experience with some of, some of the different depredation issues around the country? Uh, oh. Can you hear me, guys? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm muted. Um, well, most of it's been with entanglement threat, not the depredation. And yes, there's the smart group programs and things of that nature, which I assume we go for depredation as well, but my experience has been more on the entanglement front, the entrapment front, uh, as opposed to the, the depredation side. So no direct knowledge there. Uh, I will say this so I have the opportunity. Um, we do need to, you do need to put the you mentioned that there's the need for the science. We have to do the experiments. Uh, so that would be government grant funded, but I'm always saying the fishermen have got a uh, chip in there too and be a little bit of a scientist and for instance, with the payers, you know, doing those law books and, and finding out, quantifying what's going on, whether they're working or not, and the effect on the animals where you're allowed to use them. So just adding that. We all have to be have to do the science. Solve the problem. Is it is it just as we're all or is NIPS doing any of this research into either effectiveness or potential impacts to marine mammals of deterrence, or is that are we depending on other places to do that research. Right now, we're not in Alaska. Um, it's not certainly not out of the realm of possibility that you know it's, our science center would would be at the forefront of that if it happens, um, you know, under the agency umbrella. Um, but I think it's 
might be more likely to come through NPRB, um, come through the university system. Certainly, Kate Wynn has already done some studies to this effect through, yeah, through Sea Grant and um, UAS. Um, you know, our our job is not a research job. You know, we're we're the we're the policy management side of things, stuck in the federal building here. Um, but certainly, those are those are questions that we could consider funding. Yeah, those are those are research projects that certainly are something that our office could fund. The funds are limited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if there's been any, any look into like electronic acoustic devices for, for sea lions as opposed to just whales, like have painters ever been looked at or, or something like that besides, you know, instead of a seal bomb, but like a, some sort of electronic device you could have going or, or turn on when you saw sea lions around, that kind of thing. Is that anything you've looked at or anyone's looked at? Or? Um, I do know, uh, so that company that I showed you, those maps, Smith Roof, they were working with some uh, scientists down in Canada and they actually had, they started piloting the system where they were trying to use um, electronic pulses in the water to um, deter the sea lions, but it was also deterring the salmon. So it, it definitely was it was working, but then they ran out of money, and they I know they really want to continue with that work, and they're looking for partners to try to continue with that, because that's, I definitely think that is the way to go. I, I think that is probably going to be the, if you could do something like that on a random basis so they don't know when it's coming, I really think that would be probably the most effective method. So um, I know they're, they're working on it. I don't know if anybody else, but I, I hope that somehow they can get more funding and keep working on that. Yeah. And they're, they're actually great to talk to if you guys are interested. You know, they're really, they're very available and like to talk about what they're working on. So, I mean, I'd encourage you to talk to them if you're interested in that. Sorry, go ahead. Hi, Lyria. It's Julianne Curry. Thank you so much for helping organize all this. It's great to see you guys. So, I have a question that you may not be able to answer, which is fine, but at some point in time we're going to have to answer it. The Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act were built to be able to protect marine mammals in a time of crisis. Those acts were not built to be able to deal with marine mammals once their populations not only recover, but start to explode. And it's not just the commercial fishing industry that's having a serious problem with interactions with marine mammals, it's all of the maritime industries and kind of the general boating public. So the question is, what do we do now that these populations are exploding? Besides just trying to work on deterrent methods, is there any amendments that can be made to the act itself? Is there potential for an increase in harvest? What do we do now? I mean, I think in part we're seeing that um, that shift of baseline, right? We're used to the baseline of our own lifetime, but then you know you read these accounts from the whaling days where you could almost walk on the backs of whales. Um, so you know, to some extent, I think. We're speaking from a, a very narrow lens of our lifetimes to, to say that you know they're exploding. They, they are experiencing strong recovery, certainly, um, and we, we want to see them back to carrying capacity. We, we still will have a way to go for many, many of these populations. But of course, that human-wildlife conflict issue is right at the center of all this. Um, you know, the root of your question there, and to me, it just gets back to. Rather than changing the act, um, it just gets back to creative problem solving and more working together and more, as Kim said, face-to-face -face time, listening sessions, brainstorming sessions. Um, <laughs> my son is actually, both of our sons are actually in a camp invention this week, and I've thought already multiple times over the course of this week, we need an adult camp invention or we need to give this kind of problem to all these kids um, to, you know, to just think outside the box and come up with new solutions because it, it's really a fundamentally such a challenging issue. You know, how do we protect gear, catch human, how do we account for human safety and, you know, not use something that has that injurious or, or negative effect to marine mammal. Um, so I, I think it's on us. I think 
Well, can we get a contact for that company that you're talking about that was, uh, maybe we can get that from Sunny actually, the, the contact for the company that was um, working on the deterrent methods you mentioned in Canada? Yeah, it's just Smith, and then I think it's a hyphen root, R-O-O-T dot com, and that, go to their website and uh, that, yeah, and you, they've got a lot of the information on there, that you, they, yeah, they've got all their contact info, so. Um, and if, yeah, if you need any of that, uh, let me know and I will pass that on. Yeah, just go ahead and pass it on to Sunny if you would, please. That would be appreciated. Okay. Yep. And, you know, we may have one question back to you just in this, talking about this issue of effectiveness. It certainly seems species specific, right? That, you know, we really, we, we don't have, we don't have much to rely on. A troller doesn't have much to rely on to, uh, keep a sea lion away from, from his catch. Um, a longliner doesn't seem to have many options for a sperm whale. They, it just doesn't seem to be any effective op options. And yet it seems from the, the information that, you know, trickles back to us that um, hangers as used seem to be working fairly effectively for humpback. Um, and we're actually gonna have a student helping to look at just some of the hanger data from the observer program um, to try to shed a little bit more light on that as well. Um, and I don't know if that's anything that anyone wants to share, but um, it certainly seems very species specific and um, hopefully the use of, of hangers is, is working effectively. I just have uh, one other question which referred back to the uh populations of sea lions and the, the basis of the um, western versus eastern and the, what kind of data was used to uh, measure that the, the delineation a and b that the western population was was actually part of what's happening in, in this part of the world southeast alaska is there if you could reference that in some way uh, i and pass that on to Sonny. I, I'd be curious to see what that is. Yes, definitely. So I, I've been working on stellar sea lions in Alaska since 1998. So I worked for Alaska Fishing Game for all those years before I just started working for NIPS last year. Um, the original delineation at the 144 degree west <coughs> longitude was based on genetic evidence of um, Greg O'Corey Crow and other geneticists. Um, used different samples that we collected out in the field to, to base that on. However, after that study came out and after that delineation, uh, we continued to do a lot of brand branding in both Southeast Alaska as well as the Western population out in the Aleutians, Prince William Sound, Kodiak. And with those brand, and then we were doing brand recites every summer and then also a couple trips during the winter. And we were seeing a lot of those branded individuals that were born in the western stock that were now in the eastern stock. So they were they were um, a lot actually quite a few up in um, Graves Rocks and White Sound Rookery, so in the northern southeast Alaska. So we know from that data that we that the western stock animals are are over in uh, Southeast Alaska pretty regularly. And Lori Jemison came out with a paper in 2013 that talks about all of that, and I will make sure to get that to you as well. Thanks. Uh-huh. Um, you were talking about doing maybe some listening sessions and some information gathering sessions around the state, which I, I think that's a great idea. It is. Um, maybe somewhere you could start before that even happens is an update to your website. Uh, don't take it personally because I know that you guys didn't design every website sucks. Um, it would be nice to... Uh, <laughs> most of it. <laughs> Generally, the whole thing. Um, it's not that easy to navigate, and sometimes you can't find the information that you need. So I think a great place to start would be to produce like a one-page or a two-page um, Q&A page that lists some of the frequently asked questions and 
kind of does a better job of explaining what it is that you guys do there and what you know and what you've learned. Yeah, we are actually going through a web transformation <laughs> for what it's worth. So we're hoping to have um, a much more user-friendly website as well. Yeah, we, we would like to be able to tell our story um, just in a much more contemporary fashion and um, digestible fashion and exactly. Um, if you have any other suggestions about um, structuring listening sessions, um, please, yeah, please pass that along. Yeah, that, that's all good news. I'm glad to hear that you guys are restructuring your website, and I would just highly encourage you to peer review that before you officially launch it, or make sure that you solicit information or solicit feedback from the industry and from other marine users before you go fully public with it. Something else? I'm not gonna do for now. Um, just let us know what you need from us in order to be able to effectively do your job. I mean, Petersburg is a great resource for you guys, and we've always appreciated our collaborative relationship with you. Great, Julianne. Thank you, everyone, for yeah, you for spending the time this evening, and um, Don and Sunny for setting this up and facilitating. And as we mentioned, um, Ed Lyman will be working with folks at the Remittal Center and others at the end of the month um, to do some will entanglement response, refresher training, and uh, I think getting also bringing some new folks on board in that process. But if anyone has um, questions for Ed, he'll, he'll be in town. And um, we probably should have given y'all all our um, email addresses in closing, but um, Don, Sunny, and Julian know how to find us, so we're, we're right at the channel. How, can I ask one more? How many entanglements a year around the state are that you guys keep an eye on? Yeah, for well, for large whales, it's it's mostly humpback, and it is mostly in Southeast Alaska. Although, you know, Kodiak has also been a hot spot. Um, had some in Prince William Sound. We've um, basically a year has been. Um, Pretty standard. We missed the number. Um, we missed the number. Oh, but, uh, between ten and twenty a year, um, and I would say that that's for confirmed large whale reports. Um, we certainly get a lot of pinniped reports as well, and Kim can speak to that. I'm not sure if your question was species specific. <clears throat> not, not really. It sounded yeah. like your, your growth the humpbacks were five to seven percent a year. So I yeah, mean, we're, we're expecting we may see more of those interactions with with the growth rate. Right, yeah. and you have six thousand two hundred something something uh, whales, and you're increasing your population, and you get uh, ten to twenty. Anyways, I was just wondering. Thank you for your information. Yep, you bet. Yep. Other questions? Yeah, I'll just, uh, we still don't, you know, it's not having a population level effect, obviously, from the numbers you pointed out, but it still comes back to that prohibition on take. So we, we can't allow an individual whale to be taken, or we do our best to, you know, to mitigate that. So that's, that's why that response to an individual whale, um, even though at this point we don't believe it's a threat of having a population level impact. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks a lot for uh, doing an evening thing. Ed, thank you for, uh, for chiming in. Appreciate it. We'll see you at the end of the month. Um, and I guess we'll call it a bit. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.